Hello everyone, welcome to our lecture series on overview and integration of cellular metabolism. We are done with heme metabolism and when we ended heme metabolism we discussed that we will be discussing on bilirubin metabolism which is the topic of this class. Now we will be covering the concepts of how bilirubin is uptaken and it is excreted and that leads to if there is any problem in that pathway it leads to various disorders. Now those disorders can be right there from birth which is our congenital and it can be acquired. So, all of them lead to a condition that is known as hyperbilirubinemia where is more bilirubin. Anyway, we will be classifying jaundice, we will be noticing how the metabolic parameters are altered in different types of jaundice and thereafter we will be mentioning various tests how we can distinguish various types of jaundice. Now, in the last class, you already saw this slide where we discussed what is the normal value of bilirubin, what is the cutoff limit beyond which we will term the disease to be jaundice and what is latent jaundice, right. So, hyperbilirubinemia that is a condition where there is excess bilirubin in blood can be, uh, 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 I mean due to various causes. First cause can be due to a reason when it is present right from birth, okay? that is known as congenital and there may be reasons that can lead to a adult person acquiring this phenomena. So, that is then we call it acquired hyperbilirubinemia. All right? So, let us first discuss congenital hyperbilirubinemia. All right? So, congenital hyperbilirubinemia refers to inherited disorder of bilirubin metabolism and it always almost always presents at birth due to which it is also known as neonatal jaundice. Now, the reason may be due to abnormal intake or conjugation or excretion of bilirubin right? and those reasons are present from birth that is why they are known as inherited defects. Anyway, we are discussing the pathway by which bilirubin is uptaken and it is excreted. All right. So, we can see over here bilirubin actually combines with albumin as we have discussed. Now, albumin it reaches the sinusoidal surface. When it reaches the sinusoidal surface, albumin is dissociated and this bilirubin is actually going inside into the hepatic sinusoids via facilitated diffusion, right? It is not dependent on energy and it can actually freely go in and out. It is bidirectional. Now, what actually prevents or helps bilirubin that so that this motion can occur inward? There are two mechanisms. Number one, bilirubin actually combines with various ligands which are actually functionally similar to glutathione S transferases, all right? So, when bilirubin is captured, it facilitates so that the movement is actually inward okay? because this bilirubin is being constantly utilized number one by attaching to the ligand right? or number two by conjugating with UDP glucuronic acid which you already know by the enzyme by the sub enzyme UGT1A1 UDP glucuronosyl or glucuronyl transferase. So, number one it binds to ligands and number two it is conjugated this is how this bilirubin which is actually water insoluble becomes soluble. right? Next, what happens? As we all know, this conjugated bilirubin can actually freely cross uh, the biliary canaliculi, right? There is a protein actually which helps in this uh, movement of bilirubin, right? This is known as MRP2 or multi drug resistance protein 2, right? This is the major uh, mechanism. However, this bilirubin can actually be excreted by another ATP dependent cassette transporter and it can also be reuptaken by a minor transporter that is known as organ and organic anion transport protein 2 or OATP2. However, there have been studies where it has been shown that this OATP2 plays a very minor role in all bilirubin metabolism. right? But the main thing to remember are this thing albumin, it is getting dissociated from albumin, thereafter it is getting either bound to the ligand 
glucose glutathione as transferase it is getting conjugated by UGT 1 A 1 and subsequently after the conjugation it is removed or I mean taken up by the canalicular into the canalicular surface by MRP 2 or multi drug resistant proteins 2 which is present at the canaliculi alright. You need to be very clear about the anatomy what do you mean by sinusoidal surface what is the canalicular surface basically this is the hepatic cell that is being shown here. So, if you understand all of this it will be much easier for you to uh, I mean uh, note down all the reasons why the inherited or conjugated hyperbilirubinemia are formed. Now, conjugated hyper I mean the inherited or congenital I am sorry congenital hyperbilirubinemia that is born I mean the babies are born with that hyperbilirubinemia may be two types conjugated and unconjugated mind it the terms you should not confuse congenital means from birth and that congenital can be of two type number one where the bilirubin I mean the rise of the bilirubin is mainly unconjugated and number two where the rise of the bilirubin is conjugated I mean conjugated bilirubin goes high. So, there can be two classification of hyperbilirubinemia. So, first we are discussing the inherited disorders of bilirubin metabolism causing unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and there are three main reason number one krigler najar syndrome type 1, krigler najar syndrome type 2 and Gilbert syndrome these uh, you need to remember these names right and these are the only three names you need to remember when we are discussing with unconjugated neonatal hyperbilirubinium or unconjugated neonatal jaundice right. So, let us see what are the differences between these two you can note it down you can make your own tabular sheet and you can uh, note down these points by pausing the videos right. So, number one this krigler najar syndrome is actually caused by uh, defective conjugation. Naturally, since it is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, there will be problem in conjugation. So, in krigler najar syndrome type 1, there is virtually no conjugation because the activity of UDP glucuronosyl transferase 1A1 is almost missing. Whereas, in type 2, it is not fully missing, at least 10% uh, of the activity is somewhat present. So, there is some degree of conjugation in type 2 that is why it is a milder disease compared to type 1. Type 1 is a severe disease where there is an excess amount of unconjugated bilirubin alright. What happens in Gilbert syndrome? This activity is reduced, but it is generally 30 percent. So, Gilbert syndrome is even milder compared to kligler najar type 2 syndrome alright. So, this is the basic uh, problem in conjugation which is defective in all of these three syndromes and it is the amount of enzyme activity that differentiates all these three. So, now let us look at the outcome in uh, krigler najar type 1 what happens since it is not conjugated unconjugated bilirubin is excess because there is absolutely no conjugation as I told you in the previous class unconjugated bilirubin is insoluble however it can bind with albumin and ultimately uh, somehow it can cross blood brain barrier and it gets deposited in the brain leading to carnic terrors and ultimately it causes brain damage the entire central nervous system is coated with bilirubin right. In type 2 serum bilirubin value is around 8 to 18 mg mind it is still very high more than 2 is what physicians are worried about we are talking about 8 18 and 40 right. Whereas, in this case in Gilbert syndrome it is around 5 mg per dl right and there have been uh, I mean this Gilbert syndrome also presents in adults ok we will see very soon and it also increases during fasting intercurrent illness etcetera. So, Gilbert syndrome is basically intermittent it goes again it comes back whereas these two are present right from the birth and these two are much more noticeable compared to Gilbert syndrome. Moving on the inheritance it is autosomal recessive both are autosomal recessive type 1 type 2 whereas, Gilbert syndrome is also autosomal recessive, but it is much common compared to the type 1 and type 2 krigler najar syndrome. In fact, 9 percent of population are found as homozygous and 4 percent exhibit clinical jaundice intermittently. It is common, but it is less severe and the upper two are rare, but very severe form of diseases. So, maybe there is a this is a 
way by which nature has protected all human beings that the much severe disease is much rarer and whereas the milder disease is common right next bilirubin conjugates if we look at the level of conjugate they are almost absent because there is no activity here some amount of conjugates are present preferably bilirubin mono glucuronide i told you bilirubin is conjugated in two steps first it becomes mono and then it becomes diglucuronide right so in these two some amount of conjugated bilirubin is present but proportion of monoglucuronide is more in general diglucuronide is more than monoglucuronide all right diglucuronide is more than 80% and monoglucuronide is 20% here percentage of monoglucuronide is increased all right now treatment the drug of choice to treat all of them to treat carnic terrors and uh, these symptoms there are neurological uh, symptoms that happens due to deposition of bilirubin in the brain is phenobarbital but this has got little or no effect in case of regular naja type 1 whereas phenobarbital how it phenobarbital reduces phenobarbital actually induces the enzyme glucuronyl transferase it is a cytochrome p450 based enzyme i already told you how phenobarbital in previous classes you can look back if you have missed that phenobarbital actually induces bilirubin conjugation by increasing the activity of udp glucuronyl transferase in fact phenobarbital increases any conjugation that is done by udp glucuronyl transferase bilirubin is one such substrate right and in this case phenobarbital treatment completely normalizes because the enzyme activity is already 30 percent if that enzyme activity is somehow increased there will see, uh, i mean the hyperbilirubinium will simply vanish okay so these are the two uh, scientists who discovered uh, the syndrome victor krigler and john najar actually they first noticed a disease that is causing jaundice as well as severe neurological dysfunction or damage right and after they worked together and they jointly named the disease as krigler najar syndrome so uh, let us discuss uh, since it is very important the only uh, i mean the most important thing you need to know the major things have often already been discussed it is very fatal it appears in first 24 hours it is so uh, uh, severe right and generally uh, phototherapy should be done right we have already discussed the mechanism of phototherapy what phototherapy does is solubilizes the unconjugated bilirubin transiently so that it can be excreted and phototherapy actually increases the life expectancy otherwise the baby will die before the age of two it is if untreated right and you know what happens uh, during emergency the bilirubin can be removed by plasma phoresis it is a process by which the entire plasma is filtered okay there is an enz, uh, compound that is tin mesoporphyrin which is a competitive inhibitor of microsomal heme oxygenase right what it does it actually prevents production of bilirubin we already saw how heme is converted to biliverdin and bilirubin and heme oxygenase was one of the key enzymes this compound if heme oxygenase is inhibited there will be no bilirubin to start with and there will be no hyperbilirubinemia right we should know that the phototherapy is mostly effective when the, uh, we are dealing with small babies when as and when the age increases phototherapy becomes ineffective right and then the life the patient will die so the ex life expectancy adolescence and beyond but not full life expectancy right however can we cure it liver transplantation is the only curative therapy because here the problem in the liver enzyme right so a liver where the enzymes are actively working it can cure the patient in one patient liver cell transplantation reduce the serum bilirubin level by 50 percent there are multiple case scenarios which have been studies and we have come to the conclusion that liver transplantation is the only curative therapy okay so this is the common i mean picture you have seen in phototherapy right how phototherapy happens we discussed in last class so you see the way i mean the patient looks the permanent brain damage the abnormal eye movement the uh, i mean the abnormal mouth movement this is a still image but still it is a sine qua non what i can say it is almost pathognomic if this look with severe jaundice right from the history of birth strongly suspect regular naja type 1 syndrome right next we come to causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia again you have to remember two names dubin johnson syndrome and rotor syndrome okay so what happens let us see 
In Dubin Johnson syndrome, the conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is a result of defective exogenous transfer of anionic conjugates from hepatocytes into bile. What is this? Let us understand. Uh, in rotor syndrome, what happens? It, in mix, there is a mixed hyperbilirubinemia. There is conjugated, but there are also unconjugated bilirubin. So, what happens in rotor syndrome? This is a hepatic storage disorder that leads to defective clearance of bilirubin. But we need to know, we have studied the bilirubin metabolism in the hepatocyte. So, where lies the exact problem? In Dubin Johnson syndrome, the ex exact problem lies in MRP2. So, MRP2, what it was doing? It was actually taking up the uh, conjugated bilirubin diglycoronide and via the canaliculi it was secreting into bile, right? That is defective. That is why the conjugated bilirubin increases in the hepatocytes, okay? Next, what happens in rotor syndrome? The minor pathway that is OATP, I told you OATP 1. B1 and OATP 1B3, these are very minor pathway that actually transfers organic ion and there are problems in these proteins due to mutation in the gene SLCO1B1 and SLCO1B3. This uh, name of the genes and name of the protein are important for multiple choice question, but for viva you may not be expected to answer all of them, especially if you are an undergraduate student, you can just mention this is a hepatic storage disorder where there is problem in removing of conjugated bilirubin due to defective transfer proteins. Okay? Just by giving a generic answer, you can secure marks, but any competitive exam, definitely you need to remember the name of the mutant gene and the mutant proteins. So, uh, regarding the incidence and the rarity, it is a benign rare autosomal recessive disorder and generally it is found in Jews, so 1 in 1300. Whereas, uh, this is also again a benign autosomal recessive disorder. In this aspect, more or less, these are similar, right? So, both of them are mild. Kriglan Naja type 1 was severe, it is leading to death. These cases, no. Next, what happens regarding the bilirubin level? We saw how high it was in Kriglan Naja type 1, type 2, and it was mild in Gilbert, where as in Dubin Johnson, it is the conjugated bilirubin, it is very mild compared to those diseases around 3 to 5, right? Suggesting the existence of alternative pathway for excretion of bilirubin diglucoronide. This is the major research area because if MRP2 is deficient, right, and studies have shown the OATP are not fully uh, reliable. So, must, there must be some other pathways of bilirubin excretion and those are still being studied upon. And uh, in rotor syndrome, again as we uh, discussed, there is mild hyperbilirubinemia, both conjugated and unconjugated, which is leading to this mixed variety of hyperbilirubinemia, right? The very characteristic uh, symptom or finding in Dubin Johnson syndrome, if we look at the macroscopic, I mean look of the liver, if liver biopsy is taken or in a patient if uh, in a patient of Dubin Johnson syndrome, if any abdominal surgery is done or due to some any other reason in case of post mortem analysis of the liver, the liver is due to, liver is found to be black in color due to accumulation of pigment. Now, Contrary to many, uh, what many believe there, this is due to accumulation of bilirubin diglucoronide, it is actually no. Conjugated bilirubin accumulation is not causing this black pigmentation. It has been found to be polymerized epinephrine metabolites because not only bilirubin diglucoronide that MRP2 also removes many other organic proteins or anions that are also not removed in case of Dubin Johnson syndrome and that is leading to the black pigmentation. Mind it, the hyperbilirubinemia is due to lack of removal of conjugated bilirubin, but this black liver disease is not due to accumulation of conjugated bilirubin, it is due to accumulation of polymerized epinephrine. In rotor syndrome, there is no pigmentation, so this can distinguish these two diseases, all right. Now, there is a compound bromosalthalene. The when it is bromosalthalene is injected, 
okay we can see the study the conjugation pattern of bilirubin by injecting bromosulfenone and study its excretion a time curve is maintained what is the level of bromosulfenone that is regurgitated back to the plasma so a characteristic curve these are all uh, studies regarding livers so specialized who are hepatologists they often do these studies but for us what we need to know bsp injection gives a double hump characteristic curve in case of dubin johnson syndrome and there is no double hump curve in case of rotor syndrome however bsp clearance is low, slower okay compared to normal because it also goes through conjugation path when conjugation is defective next the excretory pattern the characteristic urinary porphyrin excretion pattern is found in dubin johnson syndrome but not in rotor syndrome right in rotor syndrome the porphyrin excretion pattern is like any other cholestatic disease we will be reading what is doing my cholestatic disease where bile flow is i mean obstructed or static in the liver so rotor syndrome urinary porphyrin excretion pattern simulates those type of diseases all right so we are done with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia i mean congenital hyperbilirubinemia right don't make this mistake congenital means from birth next we move on to acquired hyperbilirubinemias which are mainly diseases of adults right so let us see what are there so adult hyperbilirubinemia i mean acquired can also start after birth mind it congenital or inherited means there are some disorders in the enzymes or proteins right acquired is there is no such disorder but they are caused due to external factors some external factor can kick in at very early age that is absolutely normal this is known as physiological jaundice right so what happens in the it may happen in the second day of uh, the birth the age right is a transient it actually moves off the previous ones they do not disappear even after treatment so is a transient hyperbilirubinemia which is due to number one excess rbc destruction and also immature hepatic system of conjugation especially in preterm babies if the liver is not properly developed they may actually having a dif difficult i mean uh, deficient conjugating mechanism but as and when the baby grows up the conjugating mechanism the ugt enzymes they are expressed properly and ultimately this is van vanished this goes away and it seldom goes above 5 mg per dl and it generally disappears by second week of life so much milder physiological transient but a cause of acquired hyperbilirubinemia this is a term that is known as breast milk jaundice what happens in this actually uh, it is a physiological jaundice but this physiological jaundice is still prolonged right why because there is a high level of estrogen derivative in maternal blood which is excreted through milk right these are babies that are only feeding on mother's milk the this uh, material that is derived from estrogen this is a metabolite has been found to inhibit the glucuronyl udp glucuronyl transferase system all right so this again the pathology is same but this is acquired it is not the effect is not present in the baby but it is coming from the mother right also some other drugs like sulfur drugs etc that actually uh, dissociates the bilirubin and albumin conjugate that may also cause disease in the newborn so all these are reasons of acquired hyperbilirubinemia in babies now let us move to reason of acquired hyperbilirubinemia in grown ups or adults right so this is a uh, known bilirubin metabolism pathway where we already know it is being formed it goes into the liver small intestine via uh, the intrahepatic circulation it goes it is again goes back to the liver urobilinogen is excreted urobilin starcobilinogen urobilin and starcobilin urine and stool we already know this so adult what happens adult hyperbilirubinemia th the defect lies over here right somewhere in here so where it can be right it can be that there is an excess amount of bilirubin that is shunted into the system so the whole metabolic pathway there is an excess load so that everything is high right next there may be a situation where the liver cells are not functioning properly not congenital not inherited but due to some problem acquired there may be causes were acquired which are acquired liver cells are not functioning properly 
and there may be reasons when even if liver cells are functioning properly, the amount of RBCs in circulation are normal, but after conjugation there is problem, there is anatomical problem, there is obstruction, right. So, we will explore all of these. So, first variety where there is an excess RBC in the system is hemolytic jaundice. Now, again hemolytic jaundice can also be in newborn and it can be in adult. Mind it, this is not congenital, this is not in it, this is acquired, but still it is present in the babies, right. So, hemolytic disease of the newborn, what happens? A very common scenario due to mismatch of blood group. This can be an ABO blood group mismatch or an RH blood group mismatch, but the most common scenario which leads to hemolytic disease of newborn is due to RH incompatibility between the mother and the fetus. A situation where the babies are RH positive, you know what is RH positive? Suppose my blood group is O positive, you may be A positive, someone may be O negative, B negative. So, this positive and negative, this is actually the RH factor derived from rhesus monkey. You must have studied in physiology, right? So, a baby, if he is or she is RH positive and if the mother is RH negative, then there is a reaction between antigen and antibody. Often it has been seen that the first baby skips this phenomena, but definitely if the second baby is born with a RH positive but blood group to an RH negative mother, it leads to severe hemolysis and ultimately leads to a condition which is known as erythroblastosis fetalis characterized by a high level of hemolytic component and ultimately downstream products in blood. So, what happens when RBC is lysed ultimately due to excess hemoglobin, excess bilirubin will be formed, there will be excess bilirubin glucuronide since uh, there is no problem in anatomical pathway, there will be excess antihepatic circulation, excess serobilinogen will be excreted in urine. However, there is a limit to which this excess amount of bilirubin can be conjugated. When this amount of bilirubin goes below 20 mg per dl, the capacity of bilirubin to be conjugated with albumin, I am referring to the albumin bilirubin conjugation, it exceeds, right. If bilirubin cannot be conjugated with albumin, it cannot simply go to the liver to uh, get metabolized. So, up to 20, mind it, an excess amount is already going into the liver, but still if the capacity is so much exceeded that there is uh, no conjugation activity in the liver, then what happens? All the unconjugated uh, bilirubin will be uh, high in the serum, right, and it will be deposited in the brain leading to carnictus and all the problems that were discussed in Kriglanaja type 1 treatment again by phototherapy, but all of this is an acquired defect where there is an excess unconjugated bilirubin, all right. Whereas, in case of adult, adults can also have a situation where there is an excess hemolysis in the system. Why? Due to certain disorders, those are congenital or hereditary spherocytosis, glucose 6-phosphate uh, dehydrogenase deficiency leading to hemolytic anemia, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, carbon tetrachloride toxicity. So, all of them, what it does? It leads to excess amount of bilirubin that exceeds the capacity to bind with albumin, right? It remains unconjugated in blood, there is absence of bilirubin area because unconjugated bilirubin can never be excreted in urine, right? It is only the soluble uh, uh, albumin that is actually excreted. However, there is excessive excretion of urobilinogen in urine because once uro, uro, bilirubin is converted to urobilinogen in gut, it can be excreted and also starcobilinogen in feces. So, this is about hemolytic reason of jaundice in both babies and adults. Next, we move on to obstructive jaundice. What happens in obstructive jaundice? See, conjugated bilirubin is excreted in blood. So, ultimately, what will happen? You see, if there is complete obstruction, the bile cannot go to the small intestine, right? It is in the small intestine where this bile, I mean bilirubin in conjugated bilirubin in bile is actually converted to urobilinogen by the intestinal bacteria and starcobilinogen, right? So, if there is complete obstruction in the common bile duct due to any reason, what will happen? 
in the hepatocytes there will be excess amount of conjugated bilirubin right that may even backflow into the systemic circulation however there will be no conjugated bilirubin that is going into the gut hence there is no urobilinogen hence there is a condition where there will be no starcobilinogen and i already told you starcobilin starcobilinogen to starcobilin gives the characteristic reddish brown color to the stool hence the stool in obstructive jaundice will be absolutely looking pale looking or clay colored stool all right so there may be reason why the obstruction occurs we will be discussing it very soon now what we need to know is during obstruction there is regurgitation of bile in urine and since this is conjugated bilirubin urine will be very high colored urine may be very high colored okay so you see over here the common causes of obstructive jaundice are chronic active hepatitis biliary cirrhosis lymphoma that is tumor that are suppressing the common bile duct primary hepatoma and even the initial stage of viral hepatitis that is known as obstructive stage where there is stasis in the liver that is known as intrahepatic cholestasis right so all of these conditions are actually intrahepatic but some of them in some of them the tumor may be so large that it presses the common bile duct beyond the liver those are stones in the gallbladder or biliary tract carcinoma in the head of the pancreas enlarged lymph node or lymphoma in the porta hepatis that is the uh, near the uh, opening of the bile duct to the second part of the duodenum which you already know from your anatomical knowledge right so reason for bile flow is stopped inside the liver and reasons for bile flow is stopped outside the liver both may contribute to obstructive jaundice pathology and the findings are as we discussed in the last slide now what happens in the third case that is hepatocellular jaundice in hepatocellular jaundice the metabolism of bilirubin is i mean hampered so liver is not functioning so if liver is not functioning properly what will happen the conjugation in the liver will decrease in pure hepatocellular jaundice so if we are strictly speaking hepatocellular jaundice or function has been totally hampered the liver will not conjugate the bilirubin because one of the important function of liver cell is to conjugate the bilirubin but is not doing so hence unconjugated bilirubin should have been increased free bilirubin means unconjugated however since the diseases often are due to inflammatory reason liver swells up inflammatory edema it what what it does it compresses the intracellular canaliculi where bile are actually passing and therefore there is an element of intrahepatic cholestasis that is actually known as obstructive phase of viral hepatitis because the hepatocellular jaundice mostly it is caused by disease of inflammation of liver that is hepatitis and it is caused by hepatitis virus like a b c d e or g right so what happens in clinical finding we find mixed type of phenomena so there are both components of obstruction and there are both components of i mean uh, hemolysis right actually so both unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin is increased right and bilirubinemia bilirubinuria will also occur and you know the urobilinogen level in urine may be normal or even may be decreased right because urobilinogen is generally decreased in case of conjugated and there are conjugated element there may or may not be conjugated element in hepatocellular jaundice right so if we classify the type of jaundice depending on syndromes or symptoms these are the ones that you need to remember so all of these may come as a multiple choice question you should note what are the conjugate causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia which is mainly also referred to as pre hepatic or hemolytic and the reasons are abnormal red cell antibody drug reaction thalassemia hemoglobinopathy all of these are leading to either from birth or leading to a situation where there is an excess preload excess load of rbc the material before going into the liver is problematic so it is pre hepatic in hepatic the main problem is problem of the liver either due to hepatitis virus acquired or due to condition which are directly injuring the liver cell 
for example, autoimmune hepatitis, alpha or antitrypsin deficiency, all these things are what they are doing, they are contributing to liver injury, right. And lastly, post hepatic, after liver has done its job, there is problem in excretion. So, there may be cholestatic jaundice due to bile, uh, gallstone, carcinoma head of pancreas, lymph node enlargement, etc. right. Mind it, the Dubin-Johnson and Rotor syndrome also falls under conjugated or obstructive hyperbilirubinemia, right. In fact, Dubin-Johnson falls here and Rotor falls here because in Rotor I told you there are both conjugated and unconjugated component. Vandenberg reaction is one reaction by which we are, we can actually differentiate whether the bilirubin is direct or indirect. We have already discussed in, in the reaction mechanism in last class. You can go and see. Uh, just we need to note that in case of obstructive jaundice is direct positive, whereas in hemolytic jaundice where it is increased, there is unconjugated bilirubinemia, it is indirect positive. But one thing you need to know in hepatic jaundice, the it gives a milder positive reaction to start with. Then when we mix with it alcohol, it gives a full color. Hence, in hepatocellular jaundice or hepatic jaundice, the reaction is biphasic. This is the new thing that you need to know, right? Now, we are left with how the common metabolic parameters are altered in case of different type of jaundice. So, when we are considering bilirubin, so I told you only conjugated bilirubin is soluble in water, right? So, when bilirubin is not conjugated, when there is unconjugated bilirubinemia, this bilirubin cannot be excreted in urine, right? Hence, this prehepatic jaundice, where there is unconjugated bilirubinemia, this is also known as acoluric jaundice, right? Whereas, in case of obstructive jaundice, what happens to the bilirubin? This bilirubin is conjugated, but it cannot be excreted into the system, right? So, there is no formation of urobilinogen, but bilir this bilirubin itself is excreted in urine, which leads to a choleuric jaundice. So, high colored, even mustard oil color urine may be found in obstructive jaundice. So, mind it, when urine is high colored, we suspect obstructive reason. When there is excess jaundice, but there is no bilirubin in urine, we may suspect non, I mean unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, right? So, this is about bilirubin. Next, urobilinogen. So, how do we test bilirubin? Bilirubin is actually detected by Fouchet's test, right? Next, we are discussing urobilinogen. Urobilinogen, you already know how urobilinogen is formed when conjugated bilirubin goes into the gut, it is converted to urobilinogen by the intestinal bacteria. So, if there is no urobilinogen in gut, in case of obstructive jaundice, there will be when there is no conjugated bilirubin in gut, there will be no urobilinogen. So, in obstructive jaundice, urobilinogen absent or decreased. In hepatocellular jaundice, what happens? Generally, when in case of initial phase, when there is obstruction, there is no urobilinogen in urine. But ultimately, when the edema clears, alright, when the severity of the disease decreases, urobilinogen start to appear in urine. So, appearance of urobilinogen in urine in case of hepatitis is often regarded as the first sign of recovery. Again, let me tell you edema, hepatitis, active inflammatory stage, obstructive phase, obstructive phase, no urobilinogen. But as and when the obstruction clears due to medication, due to food habit, light diet, you already know what I mean. You should know that apart from phototherapy, right, that is the treatment of neonatal jaundice. In case of adult jaundice, there are uh, medicines that help in the liver to, meta, I mean, this augment this bilirubin metabolism. There are drugs like arsodeoxycholic acid that help in clearance of bilirubin and bile salts. We are prescribed lighter diet. We should avoid uh, foods from outside that may be contaminated with hepatitis virus to start with. So, all of these when it uh, decreases the load on liver, the edema is cleared up, right? And ultimately, urobilinogen starts to appear in urine. And how we can detect urobilinogen? By Ehrlich's aldehyde test, right? That has already been discussed when we were discussing porphyrin. Next, bile salts, right? So, what happens? Normally, bile salts are present in bile, but are not seen in urine. However, bile salts are excreted in urine in case of obstructive jaundice, 
all right you should know this bile salt sodium tocolate and sodium glycocolate because bile is being regurgitated to the urine right it is cannot goes via the calaniculi into the uh, gut so bile salts are present in urine this is also excess amount of bile salt that are excrete i mean uh, raised in blood so level of bile salt it causes symptoms like itching and pruritus anyway it is tested by hayes sulfur test and positive hayes sulfur test in urine it indicates an obstructive jaundice okay so here we see the total uh, uh, i mean parameters so it is a comparative analysis of different type of jaundice unconjugated bilirubinemia so you should be now able to write this on your own you just need to note down the parameters and fill up on your own so unconjugated bilirubinemia increased in prehepatic jaundice conjugated it is increased in post hepatic jaundice whereas both are i mean both unconjugated and conjugated can be increased in hepatocellular jaundice two very important things that you need to know that has not been discussed in detail because this is belongs to the enzymology domain the liver enzyme markers alkaline phosphatase is extremely high in case of obstructive jaundice all right and these enzymes that you already know and discussed in transamination alt and ast those are raised during hepatocellular jaundice where in other cases it may be normal mind it since hepatocellular jaundice has got some obstructive component alkaline phosphatase may increase in case of hepatocellular jaundice right next these three have already been discussed bile salts obstructive conjugate bilirubin is present in case of hepatocellular jaundice i mean bilirubin in urine right these are tests of blood these are tests of urine you should not be confused so urine bilirubin may also be present in hepatocellular jaundice due to the obstructive component urobilinogen it is present very high in case of prehepatic it is absent in posthepatic whereas this one earliest manifestation of its recovery and presence of urobilinogen in urine all right so urobilinogen production is uh, i mean increased in early phases whereas the in uh, later it is decreased as production is low okay in case of feces the urobilins are present therefore it is normal in prehepatic jaundice in hepatocellular jaundice it may be normal or decreased but in case of obstructive jaundice it is almost always decreased and this gives leads to a clay colored jaundice in urine mind it urobilinogen when it is there is obstructive jaundice right urobilinogen production will be hampered and therefore it will be low in urine whereas later the excretion of urobilinogen will be normalized in urine all right so don't confuse right so to conclude we have discussed the pathway of uh, uptake of bilirubin and heme in total in, uh, i mean considering all the three classes we have discussed what are, discussed what are the congenital and acquired reasons of hyperbilirubinemia we have discussed the causes of jaundice what are the alteration of common metabolic parameters and different type of jaundice and the tests by which we can diagnose and differentiate all these three types of jaundice all right so these are my references so those were my references i thank you for your kind attention